punch the clock and watch the clock and do the things I need to so that I can tell you when your, your time is, uh, you've used your time. Please understand when I advise you as to the use of your time, if you desire to continue on, that's your call, it's your time, you can use it as you, as you wish. Uh, our first case this morning is, uh, well there are five cases consolidated, but Gray and Moran Investments versus <coughs> Ocean Bank. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Alex Brockmeyer on behalf of the appellants Jason Gray, Juan Moran, and Gray Moran Investments. At this time, Your Honor, I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Very good. Thank you. It's our contention that the trial court erred in granting summary judgment in favor of Ocean Bank because a genuine issue of material fact remained as to whether Ocean Bank complied with Clause C of paragraph 22 of the mortgage. In all five cases that are consolidated here on appeal, the notice that was sent by Ocean Bank in the trial court below is identical. The notice is dated June 2nd, 2010. And the notice informed the recipients that they had until June 31st, 2010 to cure the default alleged in the notice of intent to accelerate. Under this court's opinion in Consulian, we interpret paragraph 22 according to its plain and unambiguous language. And the plain and unambiguous language of paragraph 22, clause C, states that a notice of intent to accelerate shall notify the homeowner of a date no sooner than 30 days from when the notice is sent that the default alleged in the notice can be cured by. If we look at the notice sent by Ocean Bank here, the date they specify as the date that the default can be cured doesn't exist. June 31st does not exist on a calendar. It's not a real date. And because they've attempted to satisfy Clause C by specifying a date certain that doesn't exist, there is no notification of when the default can be cured by within 30 days. And even if we were to assume for purposes of this argument that the bank meant July 1st, 2010, that would only be 29 days. But even, let me ask you a question. Did your client cure within a 30 day period? No, Your Honor, that was established in the affidavits below. We did not cure, but respectfully. Okay, but so if regardless of whether it was 29 or 30 or 31, I think your account would have met much have a stronger position if they attempted to cure within a 30 day period, whether it's July 1st or July 2nd. But the fact that there was really no effort made to cure within a 30 day period, where's the prejudice? Here's, I'll answer that in two parts, Your Honor. All right. First, Paragraph 22, it's our position, can almost be read to have dual duties. One, the notice has to actually inform the homeowner of their opportunity to cure. If they're not informed of that opportunity to cure, it's really irrelevant how long the bank actually... And did this, did this letter give them, tell them they could cure? Well, they said that they had, they had the ability to cure by June 31st, 2010. So they, they told them they had the ability to cure, but they just gave them a state they they exactly and even if we were to assume that a date that they had put in that notice was one that existed it still would not have informed them of their opportunity to care within 30 days well the banks the bank's brief indicates that your client or one of your clients made payments after the notice of default for March 2010 and April 2010 is that correct the well, March and April would have been prior to the default date that I think they're alleging here, which would have been... Well, did, did your client make payments after the notice of default? It, not to my knowledge. In, in their affidavits below, they said that there was no payments made after the notice of default was sent. So from what I see in the record for their affidavit, they're saying that there was no payment. But, I mean, if there were payments made, that only helps our position. And if the bank's conceding that, and I think that's a safe... Well, well, here's the question. Okay, let's say you didn't make payments. 
what is the harm and what is the prejudice? Because you received a letter that says you're in default. Now, you don't dispute that your clients were in default, do you? No, you're not. Okay, you're in default. You haven't paid this. You have a certain amount of time to do this. What is your prejudice? Are you saying you didn't have enough time to modify? You didn't have enough time to renegotiate? What's the harm here? The harm is this, Your Honor. Because we were not informed of our full opportunity to cure for a period of 30 days, we were deprived of our opportunity to cure. Did, the, did, it, your, did your affidavit in opposition to the uh, motion for summary judgment suggest that your client stood ready to cure on that 30th day, but because of the date was misled into believing they couldn't cure? It did not, Your Honor, but here's what, it's improperly shifting the burden onto us as the non-moving party below to establish a fact that we don't have to establish. As the moving party, Ocean Bank bore the burden of proving that there was no genuine issue of material fact and refute. Well, now, but, but in what, the second hearing, the attorney representing your clients stipulated to all the facts and said that it simply comes down to an issue of law. If in fact this is sufficient notice, we lose. If it's not, we win. So why are we, why are we talking about uh, the fact that there are still issues of fact? Wanna answer, break it up into two parts because remember we have five cases that are consolidated here on appeal and the statements that you're talking about were only made in two okay, cases. Are you suggesting that if, let me, let me just take it put it this way. You made two arguments. One is that it wasn't sufficient. The other is even if it was sufficient, it shouldn't be summary judgment because the issue of sufficiency, substantial compliance is a factual issue that has to be resolved. Are you suggesting that if we buy that it is sufficient, that we should then come up with two results on three cases, say, well, it shouldn't have been summary judgment because they didn't stipulate it in that case, but in the other two, if we agree those stipulations are binding, then we should affirm those two and re reverse the first three because of the difference in the stipulations? Well. I just want to attract the court's attention that there were arguments made via equitable or judicial estoppel and invited error. I just want to attract the court's attention that those arguments made don't apply in the three three cases. Okay, I'll go back so, and ask you then. Are you suggesting that if we get to that point that we would come up with two different results? One result in three cases and a different result in two cases? No, Your Honor. It should be one result, and that result is there's an issue of fact remaining. And with but regard, your, but your attorney can, he, he stipulated that it, it all the facts were uncontested. There were no material issues of fact, and it was an issue of law. Um, the only issue we're here today arguing about is paragraph 22 of the letter. The purpose of this trial is to preserve the issues. At any rate, I stipulate the note and mortgage should be admitted into evidence. The default letter should be admitted. I also stipulate the witness will be able to establish. Payment history is authentic and will ultimately be admitted to evidence. The only evidence I, I have is the two default letters they purport to require, et cetera. Um, we both agree the issue of this particular letter substantially complies with a, is a matter of law. It does not substantially comply. We win and the acceleration is inequitable. If you find the letter substantially completes the paragraph, that doctrine of substantial compliance is applicable here, then we wouldn't win. Why, why should we say so it was wrong for the judge to go ahead and do exactly what he was asked to do and rule as a matter of law? Here's why, Your Honor. If we look at the record, we'll see that in those two cases that we're coming up from, the trial court entered an order that granted Ocean Bank some motion for summary judgment, but it also entered an order denying our motion for summary judgment. But in that particular day, it was noticed for trial, witnesses were there, and the lawyer representing your client stood up and said, we stipulate it's a matter of law. For purposes of- Why should we take testimony? Why should we go into an evidentiary hearing? Why should we do all of that? If he stands up and stipulates, it's strictly a matter of law. You read this judge and decide as a matter of law, the substan is it, does substantial compliance apply? And if it does, is it substantial compliance? Here's why it should be a question of fact. First of all, Your Honor, when the trial court judge called this case up, it was Ocean Bank who said, actually, Your Honor, we have some housekeeping matters before us here today. We have okay, no- but, Okay, let me, let me stop you. I understand all that. I've read the transcript. What testimony, what issue 
of testimony should have been given that was not given that would resolve the facts in this issue. Not whether substantial appliance, uh, compliance applies, not whether this was or was not substantial compliance. Those are issues of law. What issues of fact should have been testified to that your client was deprived of testifying to because the judge didn't have a, a trial? We would have been able to establish, or we would have, the facts that could have been elicited is this. Ocean Bank, we're saying 29 days is substantially similar to 30 days and that by giving them 20 no, wait, 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 wait. you're making an argument what fact what no. testimony what witness is going to come what is the witness going to come in there and say that they didn't get a chance to say that would have refuted what you've already stipulated to is this is the letter and it's got a wrong date and it's not but 29 days that's already been stipulated to now what additional testimony or fact needed to be presented I, i'm going to get to that Your Honor. i'm just giving a little lead into okay, it. Okay, go ahead. And so if we're operating under the assumption that 29 days in all for all intents and purposes gives our my gave my clients below an opportunity to cure equal to that of 30. Ocean Bank should have been able to come up and present evidence to establish that 29 days is the near equivalent of 30 days. They've inserted this term into their mortgage. They should be, have the burden of establishing that 29 is not going to deprive our clients of but, enough. But who's going to testify? I, I, I mean, who, can try, who, who comes in and says, in my opinion or from what I know, this record proves that 29 days is substantially 30 days? they would be able to call up their witness and say, here's why we inserted paragraph, because it's a non-uniform covenant. They don't have to put it in their mortgage. Here's why we put paragraph 22. Why does why it was put in there matter? The issue is your client got the notice. It's got a wrong date. It only has 29 days. Why should it matter why they put it in there? I know they want to testify it was a typographical error. Well, who cares? Typographical errors don't, are not dramatic. It, the issue is we've got the letter. Everybody stipulated to it. It is what it is. And what I now, if you're suggesting to me that you had a witness ready to come in and say, and we were ready to to cure on the thirtieth day, and because that date cut us off, we couldn't do that. If that was what the testimony was going to be, that but that wasn't even raised in opposition to summary judgment. It hasn't been alleged anywhere. And I understand that, Your Honor. And I, you. you bring up the question of why. Why does it matter whether or not they put it into their mortgage? Why, do, why does that matter? And the reason it matters is that Ocean Bank elected to put this notice in there. So Okay, well, let, me, let me go back because I don't think I'm communicating with you. Evidently, you're arguing that your client's been prejudiced because there hasn't been some testimony that they could have given had they had a chance. And that's what I'm asking for. What is it your client was going to testify to that they were deprived of because they didn't get a trial. It's the mere fact that they didn't receive a notice that adequately informed that's them. That's been stipulated to. Everybody knows that. No, the bank hasn't disputed that. The bank said, hey, we've got to dance with what we brought. We sent a bad letter. Well, and your honor, in response, I would just direct this court's opinion to cases like Judy. Judy, this court's opinion, and Judy. Judy. And Judy was talking about the specification of the nature of the default, whether uh -huh. it was failure to pay, failure to buy insurance, failure to pay taxes, or all those other reasons. And the, and the bank and the, the court says because the paragraph requires that you specify the nature of the default, in that case they didn't. That's that's not apples and oranges, not the case here. But it, the notice of... And Kasulin, they filed a complaint within three days after they sent the letter. That's clearly didn't give the 30 days. This case is 150 days. So Kasulin doesn't apply either. But then we go look at cases like Curian and Wadsworth. Both those cases were cases where the notice of default said the notice has already been accelerated. What it comes down to is, like I was mentioning earlier, paragraph 22 has dual obligations. One, you have to give them the adequate notice of their opportunity to cure in no less than 30 days so that they actually know they have the ability to cure. Then the second co-duty along with that is, yes, you actually have to give them 30 days to cure. Either one, if you don't comply with either one, you're not complying with paragraph 22. You fail to rebut that affirmative defense. And if you fail to rebut an affirmative defense, then you're not entitled to summary judgment as the moving party. Well, they, did, they didn't file suit on June 31st. 
did they? No, they did not, Your they Honor. They did. They filed suit 153 days later. But the fact... And in 153 days, your client did nothing. And I understand that, Your Honor. Are you and saying that's still not enough notice? It, yes, Your Honor, I am. And here's why I'm why saying... Why are you saying that? Because if the notice never adequately informed them of that right, then they, how could they have been put on notice? And I would respond by directing the court's attention to Samaru. In Samaru, the court noted that the paragraph 22 letter there omitted the right to reinstate. They still could have found in the mortgage that they had that ability to reinstate, and yet the court said because you omitted it from your notice, you See, weren't... That's, that's, that's different. That's really different. And, and, and quite frankly, I have a very difficult time given the fact that you're arguing that you didn't, your client received a deficient notice, even though the notice indicate that you are in default, and you've even conceded that your clients were in default. And secondly, you're taking issue with the fact that it's 29 days, even though your clients, or, or I should say, um, the, the, the appellees never accelerated, never filed suit until 150 days later. And with that, if, as I indicated before, if your client made any effort to cure the default, we'd be talking about a different story. But the fact that your client failed to do anything, anything whatsoever, I just don't see how you could stand up here and make that argument that somehow because of that technical error that your client somehow was prejudiced. And I, I respect your honor's position. I would respectfully disagree. And I guess it really comes down to this. Under consulium, we interpret paragraph 22 according to its plain language. The plain language of paragraph 22 directs the bank. It says, shall give notice. The bank didn't give us proper notice here. So, so really the issue comes down. Substantial compliance doesn't apply. It's got to be a strict, literal compliance or there's no compliance. It's got to be a date. The date's got to be at least 30 days, strictly, or there's no compliance. Yes, you would have to say okay. this. And that's the issue, strict compliance versus substantial compliance. In the, in the sense that it's, I want to distinguish it from, say, like the Biscuits case. And there we're talking about language, right? So we could say judicial foreclosure or foreclosure, judicial proceeding. They're synonyms. You're going to be adequately informed either way. If Ocean Bank had said... So, so your argument is because there wasn't strict compliance, your client was misled on the amount of time they had in which to, to, to cure. For purposes of summary judgment, yes. If you want to get summary judgment, you have to strictly comply. Okay, we've gone over your 15 minutes, but we've been asking a lot of questions, so I've, I've allowed, I mean, I've, I've, um, I'll take it, I'll, I'll text that to the court. So if uh, you want to wrap it up, I'll give you your five minutes. For about Just briefly, we would request that this court reverse and remain in all five cases. Thank you. Very fine. Thank you. Is this strict compliance or substantial compliance? May it please the court, Your Honor. Peter Tappert, I represent the Appellee Ocean Bank. I believe that it's substantial compliance. Okay, let me ask you this. Is, it, is this case one in which there was substantial compliance because 29 is substantially 30? Or is this one that is substantial compliance because they had 150 days in addition? I think it's the 150 days. I think that's the question before the court is when, the, when a borrower is given an opportunity to cure, of over 150 days. So if the if the letter had if the letter had said on June the second you have until June the twelfth to cure, but you didn't file the complaint for 150 days, that would still be substantial compliance. Well, that, that's not our case. I know that, it's not your case, not but that's be. what I'm asking: is the substantial compliance the portion of the 29 is substantial, but 10 is not, or the 150 cures like gravy? It covers a multitude of sins. I would say in your, in your hypothetical, that may not be substantial compliance, and I know Judge Thompson was concerned with that, the slippery slope argument uh, down in the trial court, but I don't think Yeah, I'm not that bright. I read his transcript. That's where I got this question. <laughs> I don't think this is the case where the court has to decide what happens if you give a, a notice that specifies 10 days versus 30 days. 
I don't think this case presents those facts, and I, maybe there's not a bright line a test of, of what is and what isn't substantial compliance. I, I actually spent last night watching the Busquets oral argument it made YouTube now, and there was <laughs> a, a vigorous argument there about what the standard was, substantial compliance or strict compliance. Who was involved in that? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why it was vigorous. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I, maybe this, this issue under paragraph 22 doesn't lend itself to to a bright line test. I don't think this case presents that issue clearly, but I, I think what this case presents is a legal issue of when a borrower's given over 150 days prior to acceleration within which to cure a default that's specified in the notice, is that compliance with paragraph 22 subpart C? And the trial court said yes. The facts, as, you, as you've noted, are all undisputed. Ocean Bank came in and set the record and established and authenticated the note, the mortgage, the default notice, the amounts that were due, the defaults. And in response, there were no affidavits filed. There was one affidavit, but it was a, on a non-material factual issue. It was, we didn't receive the notice. And by the time the hearing came around, they, they receded from that position and said, well, we admit whether we received the notice doesn't matter because under paragraph 15, it's just whether the, the notice was sent or not. This court said in Consulian that paragraph 22 is clear and unambiguous. And again in Busquets, and I think this language is important, contracts are construed in accordance with their plain language as bargained for by the parties. That last part I think is important because what was bargained for, and this is a form contract, the Fannie Mae form that's used throughout Florida for residential mortgages in many states. What was bargained for by the borrowers in this mortgage was an opportunity to cure. That's how all the authorities describe subpart C. And in Florida, the Curian case that came out of the Fourth District Court of Appeals says, this is the acceleration terms are located in section 22 of the mortgage and require notice of any default and opportunity to cure 30 days prior to acceleration. They all seem to use that term opportunity to cure as you did Judge Kuzam a moment ago, even though it's not in paragraph 22 because that's the purpose of subpart C is to afford the borrower time and an opportunity. And you'd agree, Mr. Tapper, that if they made an effort to cure within that period of time, that would have created, and if they, let me backtrack, if they attempted to cure and if they were able to provide an affidavit from their client saying, we were making every good faith effort to try to cure, however, we. The 29 days is not sufficient. We needed the full 30 days. We're unsure. With that, sir, don't you think that would be an issue of fact that would be appropriate for denial of summary judgment? I do. I think that's a different case. I think if they come in and show that either they were confused, they made an effort, or they would have done something different, but for the phrasing of this notice, I think it's a whole different case. But we, we showed up in two of the cases, as you know, that were set for trial. They didn't even bring a witness. And they still, to this day, haven't proffered what the facts would be that the witness would testify to. I don't think there was prejudice. And I think in this case, they're basically conceding that they just wanted the court to decide as a matter of law, does this notice comply or not? Was the opportunity afforded to the borrower to cure the default in this case or not? As a matter of law. I think it, that's how it was presented to the trial court. And, and that's still how it's being presented to this court. Um, I cited the Curian case, the Domenico case as well, refers to an opportunity to cure. This case, uh, this court in Taylor in 2011 uh, described paragraph 22 requiring notice prior to acceleration. The key on all these cases is acceleration. And I like the language from the Jackson case we cited from the Alabama Supreme Court, which discusses the harsh consequences of acceleration and foreclosure. Once you accelerate, there's no going back. And that's the focus of 22. 22C is waiting at least 30 days and not pulling the trigger prior to 30 days. The cases where the banks filed the, the foreclosure, which in Florida is how you accelerate a loan, uh, where the banks did that in less than 30 days, and we cited those cases, Wadsworth was in the appellant's supplemental authority, Curian and Consulian, the banks filed three days after the notice or six days after the notice. Those are clear cases where paragraph 22C wasn't complied with. The ones we found from out, from out of state, uh, the Walker case out of Ohio, there was some discrepancy as to whether the note required 30 days or 50 days, and the court said 
we don't have to decide because the bank waited 65 days before it filed, and that was compliance with paragraph 22. These are all under the same, same order. The Goduto case out of Connecticut, I think it very closely mirrors ours. It was a 29-day notice, and again, the court said the defendant, in fact, had no fewer than 65 days, and that was on summary judgment, in fact, had no fewer than 65 days, and that case goes into an analysis of substantial compliance, which, which is the standard for compliance with conditions proceeding, as well as the lack of any prejudice. In, in the Goduto case, the court rejected punctilious adherence to formality and mechanistic compliance, and they said, let's look to whether there was prejudice or not. And in this case, nothing was proffered in opposition, and there was no prejudice. The, the Reese case, which we cited in our supplemental authority as well, discusses substantial compliance, again, under paragraph 22, and I think that is the standard. Busquets, that this, course, that this court entered in, in March, uh, I think provides a good roadmap as well. In that, in that case, the court wasn't looking to strictly complying with the ver verbatim language in paragraph 22. The court looked to the purpose of those two parts of paragraph 22. In that case, it was the the, the notification that it was going to be a judicial foreclosure proceeding and whether you may have the right to, to uh, re reinstate even after acceleration or not. And, and in this case, the purpose of part C, which is at issue here, is to afford an opportunity. And I think looking to that purpose, it was satisfied. 150 days is five times what, the, what paragraph 22C requires. Um, the other cases that, have, that we've cited in the briefs, I just think don't fit the facts under paragraph 22. Either the, the lender came to summary judgment with no evidence. They didn't authenticate the notice. That was DeSalvo, Domenico, Ceron, Taylor. Clearly, they, didn't, they can't get summary judgment if you don't put the notice into evidence. And then Judy and Samaru, there was a complete failure of one of the things that had to be specified. And Samaru in particular, which was decided after we filed our answer brief by the Fifth District Court of Appeal, the footnote makes it real clear that I think what the court was co uh, concerned with in that case was the omission of one of the elements. In that case, they omitted the borrower's right to reinstate after acceleration. The complete omission created the noncompliance in that case. Um, I think the court, as well, on the, on the procedural issue, was absolutely correct with the way this was presented. All the cases deal with paragraph 22 compliance as a matter of law. But there is case law that says that the issue of substantial compliance is normally not handled in a summary judgment proceeding, that that's a factual issue. I think most of the cases say that it, that it can be decided, as a matter of fact. The, the cases that go the other way say whether it was a material deviation with strict compliance could be a factual issue. But those cases, I think, were decided after trial and uh, they present uh, different facts than this, and there was some evidence on the other side. Here the record is, is crystallized. Uh, like Judge Kuzam said, if they had come in with an affidavit or a live witness ready to testify that they, that they were prejudiced or they would have done something different or confused, I think we have a different story. The, this is Gray and Moore Investments, Inc., a company that was set up to own five rental properties owned by two lawyers, Mr. Gray and Mr. Moore. That, there was no confusion. If there was, they would have showed up or filed something in opposition. Um, we also briefed, and I'll just rest on the briefs, on the, uh, the jurisdictional defect, possibly, in the notices of appeal that were filed in this court. I think we pointed it out more, more than anything for the irony that, that they're arguing we weren't prejudiced by it, since that's one of the arguments we're making uh, with respect to paragraph 22. I'll just rest on um, we briefed that issue, and we ask that the court uh, affirm the five final judgments of foreclosure. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I think the court has a firm understanding of the issues, and unless the court has any questions, I will waive my reply and just request that this matter be reversed and remanded in all five cases. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, next is Vasterling versus Vasterling.